Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for today's tutorial. Today's tutorial is on labor and CTGs given by Dr. Paul. Just a few rules. If you're watching on the Zoom, any questions or comments for things that are being covered in the moment during the tutorial, just pop them into the chat. Any questions that can wait to the end, um, pop them into the Q&A. If you're watching on Facebook Live, just comment your questions and we'll pass them on to the tutor. Um, that's all from me and I'll hand over to Dr. Paul now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sati Paul. I'm working as an F2 currently in Leeds doing obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you all about labour and CTG. This is the disclaimer. So I'll aim to go over the stages of labour, factors that kind of influence labour and um, how to interpret a, CT a CTG. So th the main aim of the lecture really, or the tutorial really, is to um, give you guys an idea of a normal labour. Um, and I'll briefly touch upon interventions, but I won't be going too much into obstetric emergencies today. So, you've managed to get pregnant you've hopefully managed to get through eight or nine months of pregnancy and it's time to give birth so when we think of labor we think of breaking your waters and having these painful contractions but there is a specific definition so we consider a woman in labor when they have forceful contractions that are affecting cervical change So you need to have both of those to be in labor. Women can have contractions on their own. They can have cervical change on their own. They can break their waters just in isolation and still not be in labor. You may have also heard of Braxton Hicks, also known as false labor or practice contractions. Um, women commonly get these um, from about 30 weeks onwards, but particularly after 36 weeks gestation. In terms of um, delivery, the, the viable gestation at the moment is considered about 24 weeks. Um, and the term baby is considered between 37 and 42 weeks. But generally, unless we have a really strong reason to, we wouldn't deliver babies at 37 weeks. It's usually. Um, 39, 40, um, however, on the other side of the scale, so if you're going beyond 41 weeks, so your post dates, that's when we start offering induction of labor. Okay, not going forward. Okay, so factors that initiate labor. There's um, mechanical factors and chemical factors. There's fetal and then there's maternal as well. So often you'll find that the mechanical factors such as the fetal position or mum's activity um, then triggers the release of chemicals which can then initiate labour. Uh, so hormones and molecules that might do this include lung surfactant which helps with a maturation of the fetal, the fetal lungs, oxytocin, um, which is a uh, uterotonic, so it stimulates uterine contractions and prostaglandins, which can be released, um, for example, when the membranes start coming away from the cervix. So I have a question here. Is there a difference between post dates, post term and post mature? Um, I've not really heard the term post mature, but post dates and post term yeah it's referring to the same thing so uh, the technical definition i think up to 42 weeks is term but generally when once they're beyond 41 weeks then we want to start thinking about initiating labor okay so induction of labor so i'll just quickly touch upon this the most gentle way is a stretch and sweep so this is when you gently insert a finger into the cervix and 
stretch it and sweep along the membranes, so between the amniotic sac and the cervix. And what this does is it can stimulate release of prostaglandins, which for some women can then initiate labour. Um, you also have the option of um, prostaglandin pessaries or gels. The pessary is basically like a little piece of sandpaper that you put on the outside of the cervix or a gel that again you put on the outside of the cervix. Um, you can use cervical dilators, which are li little rods that you just place into the opening of the cervix that help dilate it and then can, um, you know, make it possible to artificially rupture membranes or in themselves might start off contractions. And the last thing I have on the list is syntocinon. So that's the synthetic form of oxytocin, which is a hormone we naturally produce that um, stimulates uterine contractions. So, stages of labour. So this is a partogram. Ones in real life don't look this pretty, but basically um, it's a little graph of how the cervix dilates. This is, this is supposed to be a typical um, progression of a woman who's never given birth before. So a, a primiporin nulliparis woman. So you can see that it splits it up into the first stage of labour, which has the latent phase and then the active phase. Um, and then the second stage of labour, which is the delivery of the fetus, and then the third stage, which is delivery of the placenta and membranes. So the first stage of labour is defined by cervical dilatation and effacement. And when we say effacement, what we mean is the change of the cervix from being quite bulbous and um, tough to stretching out, becoming flatter, softer, more pliable. Um, the latent phase is considered from when the, os, the cervical os is closed up to when it's four centimeters dilated. This phase can last from days to weeks. Um, and then once they're at four centimeters, they're considered to be an active labor. And that's usually when women are admitted onto the delivery suite or the labor ward. Uh, so active labor is when you go from four centimeters to fully dilated, which is 10 centimeters. Um, and usually we would expect this to be within 12 hours. So during this time, the woman will need some um, monitoring, including vaginal examination to see how the cervix is progressing um, and then fetal monitoring, which depending on whether the pregnancy is high risk or low risk might just be handheld Doppler to listen to the fetal heart, or it may be CTG, um, which is continuous monitoring of the heart rate of the baby or the fetus. Um, and then finally, the midwife will document how the cervix is progressing over time on what we call a partogram, and that forms part of the picture to inform us how the labor is going. Okay, so then you have the second stage of labor, so this is where you have descent and delivery of the baby. And I'll go into detail about these steps on the next slide. But what I want to mention here is the way we assess the descent of the baby is we, we call it the station and that's um, assessed via vaginal examination. And the scale goes from minus three to plus three. So minus three is the highest and plus three is very low. So close to crowning. Um, and zero is um, the, so the neutral is considered the level of the ischial spines. So this stage of labor is very laborious. It's exhausting for the woman. It's when they're actively pushing. So even after one hour of active pushing, women will be exhausted. So this, this stage we want to limit to an absolute maximum of four hours. So you'll see that, um, if you're when you're on a labor ward the midwives will be saying oh this lady's been pushing for an hour and that's when you're sort of starting to think about whether we need to intervene okay so i've got a couple of um questions 
So one is about if a woman has failure to progress in the first stage, what is recommended first line? So this is a complex question and there are multiple answers. So I'll go into that in the end if that's okay. And then the other one is, are there painful contractions during latent phase of first stage two? And the answer is yes, there are. So often women will come in contracting um, we'll assess them and if they're still in the latent phase then we'll just send them home with dihydrocodone and paracetamol and tell them to come in when the contractions are more regular. Okay. So just going into a little bit more detail about the descent and delivery of the baby. So if you remember the anatomy of the pelvis, so you have the inlet at the top here and then the outlet. So the inlet, at the inlet, the pelvis is wider um, from side to side than it is from back to front. So when the fetus, when there's uterine contractions and the fetus is pushed down, it will engage with the head um, slightly transverse. As it goes further down and the side to side di the diameter becomes narrower, the head rotates by 45 degrees so that the back of the head is now towards the front of mum. Slowly the, the fetus will come down as it crowns and comes out the neck will extend backwards. Once the head is out then outside the body the head then rotates back into a more um, transverse position back in line with the body. So this whole time the body has stayed in the same position inside the head rotated a little bit, it comes out and then rotates back. So the, the baby's at an angle sideways. And then once the head is out, the body turns a bit more so that baby is basically lying on its side. The anterior shoulder is uh, delivered first and then the posterior shoulder and then the body just follows. So baby's out and then what's left is the placenta and the membrane. So that's the third stage of labour. And this usually occurs within 15 minutes. Sometimes it takes a bit longer, but usually if it hasn't happened within one to two hours, then they need intervention. Um, women, can, women can deliver the placenta and membranes by themselves or if there's if it's considered that there's a need to, or if the mum wants, then we can manually um, deliver it with controlled cord traction. And that's just where you provide a gentle sustained pressure on the cord with a hand on the uterus to slowly bring the placenta out. And then what should happen is the uterus should contract right back down. And this is to stop bleeding. Um, in some women this might not happen as well and um, we will often use either prophylactically or because someone's bleeding a lot again syntocin on which contracts the uterus. Okay so we've got a question here. So which of the following processes do uterine contractions drive? A cervical dilatation B, rotation of the fetal head. C, descent of the fetus. D, cervical effacement. Or E, all of the above. So I'll just set up the poll. I'll just give you a few more seconds. Okay. 
So most of you have said all of the above, which is absolutely right. So as the uterus contracts and pushes down the fetus, the head um, pushes against the cervix and affects dilatation and effacement of the cervix. As the fetus descends also because of the shape of the pelvis, the contractions combined with the shape of the pelvis um, initiate rotation of the fetal head. Um, and then the final one, which was descent of the fetus. So that is a combination of the contractions of the uterus as well as the uterus pulling away from the fetus. So the upper fibers of the cervix shorten when it contracts. So it's both pushing the fetus down and also pulling away from it. Okay, so just before we move on, I had a couple of questions. So one was, um, does the baby enter the bony pelvis during or before the second stage of labor? So the baby will engage with the pelvis in the second stage of labor. Um, well, properly, sometimes it will come down, it will, it will, it will be down in the first stage, but um, it will properly engage in the second stage. And then, sorry, this might be a simple question. Are there any medical conditions initiate, indicating active third stage of management? And it's not a simple question, and I, you shouldn't say it like that at all. Um, so there are, so for example, if someone has a clotting disorder, but also there are obstetric, obstetric risk factors, such as, for example, if someone's a grand multip, so if they've had a lot of um, children, then they're at, at higher risk of bleeding. Uh, or, for example, if they're severe, severely anemic before they even go into labour, so they've got a low reserve, then you might um, go for active management of the third stage. So that's controlled um, delivery of the placenta combined with use of syntocinon um, to help the uterus contract afterwards. Okay. I've had another question about um, estrogen and progesterone, which is um, a bit more specific, if you don't mind, I'll answer that at the end. Okay. So next question. So the second stage of labour should last for a maximum of how long? Okay, so most of you have said four hours, which is right. That's the absolute maximum, though. And I understand why some of you have said one or two hours, because that is around the time when we start thinking about intervention. Um, some women who have an epidural, we might let them um, push passively for an hour before getting them to actively push. So that might be about two hours before we start thinking about doing anything. But four hours is the absolute maximum. Okay. Um, I just had another question, which was, can active third stage lead to an increased chance of PPH? So in theory, it should be reducing the chance of PPH, but I suppose it depends on um, the clinician uh, delivering the placenta. So if you are not careful with the delivery, if you're too aggressive, then it can lead to a PPH or at least, you know, a significant amount of bleeding. Okie dokie. So, um, just one more question. I haven't discussed this, but I thought 
let's see what you think. What might, what might be the biggest risk of failure of this third stage of labour? So failure to pass the placenta and membranes. A, abdominal pain. B, hemorrhage. C, infection. D, perforation due to intervention, and E, hysterectomy. Okay. So most of you have said hemorrhage, which is correct. So it can lead to any of those things that I've listed there. Pain, infection is definitely a risk. Um, if you need to va surgical evacuation of the products, then yes, um, you're at higher risk of perforating the uterus just after delivery. And um, the last one is also a possibility because the thing we worry the most about with retained products is the risk of hemorrhage. And that's because the uterus starts bleeding and contracting to try and get rid of those retained products. Um, and in cases where everything has failed and we've not been able to stop the bleeding, then unfortunately, sometimes you might need a hysterectomy. But generally, if it's due to retained products, um, once you've evac evacuated the products, the bleeding will stop. Okay. Um, so I, I said I wouldn't really go into obstetric emergencies, but this is, I think, quite a good little thing to know. And I like, so the four T's of PPH, so postpartum hemorrhage. Um, tone, trauma, tissue and thrombin, they're the four main causes of PPH in order of um, frequency. So most commonly it's that the uterus doesn't contract well enough to stop bleeding. Okay, so that's just a summary of what we've talked about. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the three P's. So um, the three factors that are essential to a successful delivery. So their power, passage, and passenger. So when we talk about power, we mean uterine contractions. So we want frequent, strong, and regular contractions. We describe the frequency as three in 10, or two in 10, or six in 10, um, and that's referring to the number of contractions per 10 minutes. And the ideal number is three to four contract in the in the active phase of the first stage, we would expect three to four contractions in 10 minutes and similarly in the second stage. And then passage, that's talking about the pelvic size and the pelvic shape. We're talking about the dilatation and um, effacement of the cervix. And we're talking about the vagina and perineum in terms of becoming soft and stretchy and allowing for the head to come. Um, you need to be particularly wary of women who are really short, really obese, or have had previous trauma to the um, pelvis because they might be at increased risk of dystocia, which is where um, the head, you've delivered the head, but then you can't deliver the rest of the body and the neck is stuck um, in, you know, in the cervix or less worryingly in the vagina, but particularly if it's stuck in the cervix, then that can cause fetal hypoxia. Okay. And then third of the P's was passenger. So that's your fetus. 
So we think about the attitude, so the degree of flexion of the neck. So are they extended? Are they flexed? Um, the position, so how rotated they are. So if they're, um, if you think about the pelvis, if they're at the wrong angle, they can get stuck. And then the size of the head, um, which may be altered also. It might be altered just because the baby is that size. It might be altered because, say, mum has diabetes or the, ba the baby could have um, congenital or genetic abnormalities. Um, and really, the, main, the more important thing than the size alone is the size, in relation, the size of the head in relation to the size of mum's pelvis. So the best fit of, um, is, is when you have the baby flexed and OA at the pelvic outlet. And what that means is that the, head, the, head, the neck is flexed like this and it's occiput anterior. So the occiput, so the back of the head is towards the front of mum. And what that means is that the dome of the head is against is applied to the cervix which is the smallest diameter of the head okay so fetal position is a really important part of assessment during labor so we think about lie so are they longitudinal are they transverse we think about their presentation so are they head down or are they feet down ideally we want them to be head down we think about the attitude as we discussed so are they flexed or is the head flexed or extended so flexed is generally good but if if the baby's head is also already extended then and the, their position means that during delivery the neck will become hyper extended that's not good because you can end up with um, damage to the to the spinal cord in the fetus um, and then there's the position. So when we're talking about position, we're talking about the rotation of the head and we refer to it in terms of where the occiput is, so where the back of the head is. So we'll say occiput anterior, occiput posterior, and so on. And we also talk about engagement, and this is particularly in the early stages of labor. So we might feel, we will feel the abdomen and we'll say, oh, we felt a fifth or about three fifths of the head and so on. So uh, assessment will be examination, so transabdominally, vaginally, and we can also use ultrasound. So this is just a quick representation on the right of the different positions that the fetus may be in. And the reason I put the skull here is because the main way we assess the position of the fetus is by doing a vaginal examination and as you may remember from pediatrics um, babies have these two fontanelles so these soft squishy bits in their head one that looks like a triangle and one that's more like a diamond and by feeling those on vaginal examination we figure out which way the baby's faced so if there's any if there are any problems in um, during the labor, the woman may end up needing intervention. So the simplest of which is an episiotomy, which is a cut that you do diagonally um, away from, so at about seven six o'clock, seven o'clock, away from the anus. And that's to both to allow more space and to redirect the stress away from the anal sphincter to avoid tears that could lead to um, sphincter incompetence. Um, other types of in intervention include von Tuss, so that's where you apply a small cup to baby's head um, and gently pull. You can only really use that when the fetus is quite low down and already coming, but mum just needs that extra little bit of help or baby just needs to come a little bit more quickly because there's signs of fetal distress. And then there's forceps, so they're little cup-shaped um, spoons, or they, they describe them as spoons. Um, you have Neville Barnes, so that's when the fetus is in the right position, um, they just 
need to come a little bit more quickly so you, and they might be a bit higher up so you put the uh, forceps on and you just gently pull and that can be done in the room or there's another type, type of forceps that's not used everywhere it's called keelans and that's when um, the baby is rotated in the wrong position and you need to turn them first before you can pull them so that's done in theatre generally um, and what you do is you push the head up you rotate it into the occiput anterior position and then gently pull and if that's if that fails then it proceeds to cesarean section which is the final one which i'm sure most of you have heard of so classically that's a transverse incision in the lower part of the abdomen um going into and then going into the uterus to deliver the fetus and placenta so during labour, we talked about how we monitor um, cervical dilatation and the contractions, but we also need to monitor mum's well-being. Labour is incredibly stressful, not only mentally, but physically for both the mother and the fetus. Um, it's really important to monitor temperature, heart rate, blood pressure and urine output. So women can become very dehydrated um, they will often spike temperatures in labour. It's not necessarily indicative of an um, infection, but it might be. Um, labour is often the first time that women end up having high blood pressure, which I'm sure you all know is um, something we obsess about a little bit in pregnancy because of the association with preeclampsia. And um, again, the urine output because of dehydration. Okay, so the, I think there's a question about the layers we cut through in C-section. So if there's time at the end, we'll definitely go through that. Okay. So what I'd like to talk about next is monitoring baby. So what you've probably all heard about is CTG, which is a cardiotocograph, but it's not the only form of monitoring. So methods of fetal monitoring include Handel Doppler, which is literally like an ultrasound um, to, or a Doppler to listen into the fetal heart, um, similar to how you'd use a stethoscope. Um, the second is CTG, so cardiotocography, and that's continuous monitoring of the fetal heart rate. Um, you can use that from about 28 weeks onwards. We generally don't use it before 28 weeks because the fetal um, central nervous system isn't developed enough for the CTG to be useful as a tool. Um, you, can, you can do a CTG both transabdominally trans or during labour you might put an electrode on the fetal scalp. And you would do that mainly if you're not getting a good trace through the tummy or mum's moving around a lot or, you know, mum might be really big or baby might be really small and you're not getting a good trace. The third thing you can do is fetal blood sampling. So that's when you make a small scratch on the baby's head and take a small blood sample, which you can run a gas on. Um, and that can just provide a bit more information. Each, each of these methods has its own limitations, um, which I'll, I mean, I'll talk about CT, the limitations of CTG here. So it's not, it can't always, it's not specific enough to detect hypoxia all the time. So that's when fetal blood sampling might be useful. Um, also, CTG with CTG you can't interpret it alone it has to be in a clinical context it depends on the person looking at it and because it's so non-specific it can be difficult to interpret what you're seeing you might have a happy baby with a bad CTG you might have a compromised baby with a normal CTG so it's all about context it's all about the other signs of what's going on we also know that CTG increases intervention. Um, so there's a lot of discussion around that, that you know, it might trigger us to do things that may or may not be needed 
um, because the CTG appears to be um, abnormal or suspicious. Also, as I mentioned, it is affected by physical factors such as um, maternal BMI. So this is just a visual representation of, how, of what kind of electrodes we use. So um, when it's transabdominally, you have two transducers. One is um, monitoring the fetal heart rate and the other one is monitoring contractions. And if you're doing it internally, then you have the scalpel electrode, but you'll still have a transabdominal one for mum's contractions. So this is an example of a CTG. The top line is the fetal heart rate and the bottom line is um, the uterine activity. Now it's bas it basically measures the tension, so it's supposed to be an indication of uterine activity. I think there's a couple of these written. Sorry, I was just looking at the questions on there. Um, I, th I think somebody missed the um, definition of labour. So what I was saying is it's forceful contractions affecting cervical change. Um, so you might, that's the important thing, that the contractions are leading to cervical effacement and dilatation. You might have cervical change on its own or you might have contractions on its own, but that's not labour. It's not labour if they're not happening together. Okie dokie. So, um, the mnemonic that we used to use in medical school was Dr. C. Bravado um, when it, for interpreting C, uh, CTG. So, before you do anything, you always need to define risk. So, maternal risk and fetal risk. Then you look at contractions, then you look at um, specific um, parameters about the fetal heart, so about the, ba the baseline rate, the variability, accelerations and decelerations, and then you need to um, decide on an overall impression. So as I said, context is everything with the CTG. You need to think about the mum, so does the mum have any medical problems? Does she have hypertension, asthma, obstetric cholestasis? Um, diabetes. You need to think about baby. Does um, is, you know is baby small? Do we know that the placenta hasn't been working well? Has baby's growth been tailing off? Um, all these things give us an idea about their reserve, and um, it can affect the way we interpret CTG. Not only because you might have a lower threshold for intervention, but also you might expect different changes in different situations. Then you look at contractions. So as I said, as I said you describe it, the frequency as X in 10, so two in 10 or three in 10. Um, you look at the regularity and you look at the strength. Now, the reason I put strength in brackets is because on a CTG, you can't really reliably um, assess the strength because it is affected by things like BMI. So that that last bit, mainly the midwife or the doctor will assess by literally just putting the hand on the abdomen. On the CTG, each big square is one minute. So um, generally when you look at them, if you can see the two sets of numbers vertically between them tends to be 10 minutes. So this one we would say is two to three in 10 contractions. So then we look at the fetal heart rate. So um, if you look at this, if you ignore the bits that kind of deviate significantly, you could you can imagine that you could draw a straight line um, that follows the general trend, and that would be your baseline heart rate. So in this case, it would probably be about 140. So ideally, we want the baseline rate to be between 110 and 160 beats per minute. And then we look at variability. So that's the little ups and downs that you have um, within the baseline. 
um, and ideally we want that to be more than five beats. So, and the reason for that is because the fetus responds to even the smallest of um, changes in stimuli in its, in its environment and that's a reassuring feature that they're doing well. So actually it's the most sensitive, it's the first thing that we tend to see that goes off when a, when a fetus is struggling is that their variability reduces and that's when obstetricians start to worry that something's going wrong. Next, well, next we look at accelerations. So this is when you have an increase in the heart rate of 15 beats or more for 15 seconds or more. So again, this is a sign of fetal reactivity that they're doing well, they're responding well to their um, environment. So you can see these, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but on the left, you can see two broadish peaks and then in the middle, there's a slightly narrower one, um, which you would cause, which you would, um, describe as accelerations and they are a reassuring feature. And then you can have um, decelerations. So this is where you have a drop in the heart rate by 15 beats or more for 15 seconds or more. Now this can be normal in labour. So as you know in labour you're having uterine contractions, the head gets squeezed not only by the uterus but then also as it's passing through the pelvis. Um, and it, 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 that, can, that can cause a drop in the heart rate. And the fetus, this is a physiological part of labour, so fetuses are built to cope with that. But, the, but may, one way to describe it is that when you have compression of the head, it's like holding a breath. So they are able to hold a breath and just like us if we hold if we have to hold our breath for too long or we're having to do it too often then we can start to struggle and it's the same for fetus. So um, some are normal but we want to look at whether they are related to contractions and whether they are recovering well and how often those dips are happening. But we'll, we'll have we'll have a look at, at some examples of that in a moment. Oh, sorry. And then the last thing is the overall impression. So, in an antenatal CCG, you would either say normal or abnormal. Um, in labour, we say either the CCG is normal, it's suspicious, or it's pathological. So, um, if you have a pathological trace and it's not recovering, that's when you need urgent intervention. Thank you for that, we can see your cursor. <laughs> um, so this is an example of a trace, well, this is a hand-drawn one of a CTG with reduced variability. Um, particularly, and, and there's also no decelerations, particularly if this is associated with a tachycardia, that's quite worrying. So you might look at the mum and the mum has a temperature and you start to think, okay, is this baby, is this fetus septic? Is this fetus compromised? Um, in this trace, we can see that there are some what we call early decelerations. And the reason we say early is because that they're in line with contractions. And um, this is, you only want to see this in the active second stage of labor when mum is pushing. So yes, it can be normal, but only really when mum is pushing and there is compression, there is active compression of the head. Even then, you don't want to see it too often. I use the analogy of holding your breath. So if, if, the, if, the, if the fetus is holding their breath too often, then they will struggle. So we want to see that it's less than with 50% of the contractions. So if there are decelerations with more than 50%, then we um, 
start thinking a little bit. In this trace, these are late decelerations, so there's a little bit of a lag after the contraction before you have the deceleration. And similarly, I think this trace is the same, but you can see some other decels here. So variable decelerations are when you have decelerations of different amplitudes and different shapes. Um, and these can both be indications that um, there is some impairment of oxygen supply to the baby. Okay, so I have this CTG for you. I'd like you to take a few seconds to have a look at it. Okay, so what is concerning about this CTG? A, reduced variability, B, bradycardia, C, frequent decelerations, D, inadequate accelerations, or E, inadequate contractions. I'll launch the poll. And I'll go back to the CTG so you can have a look. Give you a few more seconds. Okay. So most of you have said frequent decelerations. So I'm sure you're all looking at this bit on the right hand side of the CTG. So if I go through all the options here, so the variability actually here, it's not bad. Yes, here it's a bit reduced, but overall there is variability. Um, bradycardia, from sort of this point onwards, I would say this is a fetal bradycardia. There's no identifiable baseline, which is concerning in itself, but most of it lies below 110 beats per minute anyway. In terms of frequent decelerations, um, I mean, there's maybe, maybe one here, um, but mainly, I mean, I can understand why you would call that, but I, if anything, I would maybe call this a prolonged decelerate. I would call this a bradycardia. And even if this were, even if you counted them as a couple of separate ones, I wouldn't call it frequent. I think the main thing I was trying to say was this is a fetal bradycardia. Um, there are some accelerations though, and contractions, yeah, the, I mean, on, in this portion, it's, it's difficult to interpret, but in the first, in the, on the left, it's only about three, two or three, which is okay, but maybe not completely adequate. So you have this trace, there's a fetal bradycardia. Um, assuming that you've already taken steps to try and recover the heart rate, what would you do next? So would you A, observe for a further 10 minutes, 
B, encourage the woman to increase her efforts to deliver the baby more quickly. C, give syntocinon to speed up the labour. D, instrumental delivery. Or E, emergency caesarean section. Bear in mind that on this CTG, this, uh, this period on the right is lasting more than five minutes at this point. I'll give you a few more seconds. Okay. So most of you have said emergency caesarean section. Oh, I haven't shared it. Yeah. Most of you have said emergency caesarean section. Some of you have said instrumental delivery, and a couple have said syntocin on I encourage the women to observe. So a, pro, a prolonged a, a bradycardia that's not recovering after intervention such as position change is an obstetric emergency so you would want to deliver that baby urgently you wouldn't want to observe um, getting the woman to push is probably not going to be enough if they've not already, you know, gotten to the point where you can do something about it, um, where you can help her along. Um, Syntocinon is not what you want either. That will take too long. The answer is depending on the situation, either urgent instrumental delivery or emergency cesarean section. So it will depend on where the woman is in labor. So say, the woman is, uh, you know, far, far on in the second stage, baby is quite low down, um, but in, now in distress, you can get forceps on or you can put a cup on, then you deliver them. Because it's not ideal. If baby's that far down, doing a cesarean section is not ideal either. But if necessary, it's necessary. Um, on the other hand, um, if they're, if, if the, if the woman's not far enough in labor or perhaps if, if the baby's in a mild position, then you would just go for an emergency cesarean section. And this is, this is where you would go for what we call a category one cesarean section where you want the baby delivered in 12 minutes. Okay, so have a look at this trace. So I have a question for you now. On a scale of good to bad, where would you place this CTG? A, excellent. B, good. C, okay. D, this is a little concerning. Or E, I'm peeing my pants as I run to theatre. I'll just flick back to it so you can have a look. <clears throat> Mm 
So most of you have selected the correct answer. So this is a pre-terminal trace. This baby, this fetus is compromised. Um, you would go straight to theatre. Many of these um, babies won't survive. They'll certainly all need resuscitation and support. Um, I have a couple of questions, I think. So um, I think just about the bradycardia before. So the reason this is a fetal bradycardia rather than a deceleration is because there's no recovery to the baseline. So when it's a deceleration or an acceleration, you have a rise and then a fall back to the baseline or a fall and then a rise back to the baseline. This, however, has fallen and then fallen further and then stayed down. And um, if you remember the lower threshold or the lower limit we like for a heart rate is 110. So a significant portion of this, so probably about five, for about five minutes, or if you include this, about six minutes of this trace, the fetus is bradycardic. And the other question was, how many categories of cesarean section are there? Um, and the answer to that is four. So there's category one, um, which is the most, so category one to three are emergency. Category one is the most emergency. Um, so you want to deliver within 12 minutes. Category two is that um, it's not, you know, absolutely immediate, but you do need to deliver early. Um, and then category three is semi-elective. And then category four is, it's not an emergency. So that's a, you know, that's a planned cesarean section. So that's just a summary of what we talked about with the CTG. Okay, so which of the following are not limitations of CTG? A, they're easy to interpret. B, the non-specific. C, the increased intervention. D, they're affected by physical factors such as maternal BMI. And E, they reduce the mother's mobility. I can see this is splitting, splitting everyone up. <laughs> Give you a few more seconds. Okay. So most people have said reduces mother's mobility. Um, I've actually said um, that it's being easy to interpret is not a limitation. Um, which would be true, and I've clearly confused myself in the double negatives, but basically what I was trying to say is that it's not easy to interpret um, because it depends on, as I said, you need to think about the clinical context. So you need to think about the risk factors and you need to think about the stage of labor and you need to think about how mum is doing and all these things. And um, even with a lot of experience, it can be tricky to tell what a certain pattern in a CTG means. Um, hmm. 
being non-specific is a limitation as i was saying it's not specific enough to pick up hypoxia a lot of the time um, it does increase intervention it is affected by physical factors these are all um, factors that that are disadvantages of ctg but also reducing mum's mobility that is that is a disadvantage um, because mobilization particularly in um, the earlier stages of labor is really important and it can be really helpful and even later on in, in when you're in the second stage it can really help mums cope and some women want active births and they want to be in certain positions um, it can help them physically and both mentally and having a continuous monitor um, can hinder that Another question has just popped up. Um, so someone said it might be easy for some consultants to interpret. Um, you said it's user dependent. Um, it's user dependent, yes. So the so CTGs are about pattern recognition and um, pattern recognition makes assumptions and is, is not foolproof so yes if you're more senior you're more likely um, to, to feel comfortable drawing conclusions from a CTG but there are there have been plenty of times where I've been con with, the, with consultants who are unsure because as I said there's multiple factors that go into um, the patterns that you see in a CTG um so somebody else has asked how would you know they have hypoxia so um firstly you need to suspect it from the clinical scenario so going back to it you need to think about the risk factors so um does mum have any problem does the fetus have impaired reserve um, how has this labor been going has it been prolonged has it been obstructed has it been difficult um, does does the mum seem septic um, does the you know does the fetus have any abnormalities so there's you think about all those things you think about what's happening has has the fetus passed meconium is there a possibility that they've aspirated meconium and then you look at um, the CTG so are there any abnormal features on the CTG so is there reduced variability are there late decelerations are there you know has has have they had a period of bradycardia or um, a period of tachycardia um, and then what you can do to then look a bit further into it is do a fetal blood sampling. So the pH on that can help particularly. So if a, um, if a fetus is significantly hypoxic, then um, you, you, might, you will find that they're acidotic on that gas. Um, this is this is a bit of a niche point but fetal blood sampling is also not the be all and end all so in actually in in a septic fetus um you might have a completely normal um ph but that fetus is compromised so as i said each form of monitoring has its own limitations okay i think i've overrun there um so I should probably pass back to you know I think that's oh I've just got the takeaway messages so um, labor remains a potentially life-threatening process for both mom and baby it's been said time and again that going through labor is for a woman is like being reborn um, labor comprises three stages in the UK it's generally midwifery led um, Doctors are unfortunately only really called when things go wrong, <laughs> but they, we play an important, or in high, high risk cases, but we play an important role in monitoring and um, deciding on appropriate intervention. 
Power, passage and passenger are the three key factors that you need for a successful delivery. Take any one of them out and then you won't, and you won't have a delivery. And um, CTG can be used for monitoring and it can be an indicator of fetal well-being, but it can't be relied on in isolation. Um, and then that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, that's another... Okay, I think there were a couple of, Hinal, if there's, um, oh, thank you, okay. So I think there's a couple of minutes for me to answer questions. So, um, there was, I think early on, someone asked if a woman has a failure to progress in the first stage, what is recommended first line? Um, so that's not really an easy question because it depends at, at what, in what part of the first stage they've kind of stopped. Um, and so I can't really say, oh, this is first line. Um, it might be that it might, but it might be that you break the waters. It might be that you give them syntocin on. It might be that um, it might be something else. Um, it's it, and it, and you need to take into account both maternal and fetal well-being. So I, I wish I could could give you a clear cut answer, but it, it's it's not that. It is some. It is a very individualized decision depending on the case. Um, just having a quick look through who the questions are. Um, the, so there was a question about, is oestrogen a pro-labor hormone, i.e. towards the end of pregnancy, oestrogen stimulates the production of gap junctions between myometrial smooth muscle cells and progesterone, a pro-pregnancy hormone, i.e. inhibits changes in the uterus that are involved in labor and delivery. Um, I am not sure about that question. I would have to check. Um, if you would like, I can, uh, and you want to leave your contact details, I can get in touch or you can look it up yourself, but uh, sorry, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, and then we, there was a question about the layers of C-section. So off the top of my head, and forgive me if I miss anything, so you go through the skin, you go through the um, subcutaneous fat, then you go through the rectus sheath, um, and then you split the muscle, and then you have the peritoneum, and then the uterus and then usually when you go into the uterus um, at least if it's an elective cesarean section then you'll have the membrane um, so the amniotic sac and you'll go through that and then you deliver the baby i think that's everything Hinal, shall I pass it back to you? I've kept you all for far too long. Yep, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and yep, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>